In our last video, we found out that there was a problem with meshes. They were too complicated. And for that reason, we defined outer meshes. Now, we're going to see how we can find outer meshes. Because again, if I ask you for an example of an outer measure, it's still a somehow complicated structure. Remember, an outer measure was a function mu star defined over parts of our set x and that went to zero infinity and it had to satisfy three things the first one was that we ask mu star of the empty set to be zero we ask for monotonicity so if a is a subset of b then mu star of a is smaller than or equal to mu star of b. And the final property was countable subadditivity. So if we had a sequence E sub j countable in parts of x, then what we wanted was mu star of the union to be less than or equal to the sum of the mu stars of each set. And in this video we will see a proposition that will be very helpful together with a theorem we'll see ahead called Karatadori's theorem to find measures from our measures. So let's jump ahead into this proposition. The proposition says what follows. We have E as a subset of parts of X and the function that takes elements in this set and gives them numbers between zero and infinity. And the function and the set are such that the empty set and the whole set is indeed a subset of parts of X and rho of the empty set is zero. We kind of know where this is going. We're gonna try and somehow measure things with this function rho. Not exactly because rho is not a measure, not necessarily, but it will be useful for defining measures. In this case, for defining outer measures. So when we define this mu star of a for any a, a subset of x, as the infimum over all the sums of rho evaluated in some sets E sub j that are in this family E and that cover A. So what happens when we define this is that this mu star is an outer measure. So we found our first outer measure given just any set E subset of parts of x that has the empty set and the whole set and the function rho defined over this set e that satisfies that rho of the empty set is equal to zero then we are able to find an outer measure so let's prove this proposition we have to prove that mu star is an outer measure and for this we have to prove that it satisfies these three properties So let's start with the first one. We have to prove that mu star of the empty set is zero. This is what we have to prove. Well, what happens if we take E sub j to be equal to the empty set for all j? Well, then mu of a in this case, A would be the empty set, mu star of A is the infimum over all the sums of rho of E sub J where this happens. Well, the empty set, because of what we have here, the empty set is an element in this set E. 
And also, rho of the empty set is zero because we are asking for this condition here. So mu of a, in particular, when I grab a specific cover of zero, and remember, in this case, a would be the empty set, will be less than or equal to what the infimum gives us. That is, mu star of the empty set is smaller to the sum from j equals 1 up to infinity of this particular cover of the empty set. Now, a is the empty set, and I found a specific cover, this one, of the empty set. So mu star of the empty set is smaller than or equal to the sum of rho of e sub j. But now rho of e sub j, because e sub j is equal to the empty set, this is equal to zero. And also mu star is greater than or equal to zero. So this gives us that mu star of the empty set is zero. And we finished the first property, improving that mu star was indeed an outer measure. Now let's move on to property number two. So we have two sets, A and B. A is a subset of B. Let's see what happens with the covers of A and B. Well, it's obvious that any cover of B will also be a cover of A. But there are some covers of A that may not be covers of B. So then what this is telling us is that the covers of B, the set of all the covers of B, is a subset of all the covers of A. So when we take the infimum given by the definition of mu star, when we calculate mu star of A, we're taking infimum over a larger set because there are more covers available. And so this gives us that mu star of A will have to be smaller than or equal to mu star of B, just because there are more covers of A than covers of B. And that's it, this gives us the second property, so let's prove number three. And for this, we are gonna take a sequence, a sub j, countable, so from j equals one up to infinity, of parts of x. Well, mu star is defined with an infimum. So let's take a number delta greater to zero. The definition of an infimum tells us that for this delta, for any delta positive, there exists a cover E sub I sub J from I equals one up to infinity, such that it is a cover of A sub J and because of the definition of an infimum, we can say that for this particular sequence that we know exists for this specific delta, then the sum from i equals 1 up to infinity of rho of these sets is smaller than or equal to mu star of a sub j plus delta 2 to the minus j. And this might seem very complicated, but it's actually not. Let's just think about the definition of an infimum. And for this, if I give you this interval, let's say that this is one of the borders and the other one, it's an open interval. then we all agree that the infimum over this interval is A. So what does all this gibberish mean? Well, what it says is that 
If I am standing in A, I'm here, and I move a bit towards the right, so I would be now standing here in A plus delta, so A is the infimum, and I move the infimum plus delta, then what the definition of an infimum says is, hey, you moved, so there has to be an element here of the interval. Every time I move a bit towards the right from the infimum, there is an element in the middle. So this is exactly what this other thing is telling us. Well, you have this positive number delta. And you say, okay, I'm gonna move from the infimum some number towards the right. Delta times 2 to the minus j. And this 2 to the minus j, you'll see now in a minute why am I adding it. It's just to make calculations easier. But let's just call it like this. I'm moving from the infimum a bit towards the right. And this tells us that this green element, let's call it c, c is actually smaller than or equal to a plus delta. This is from this graph. And so, well, what are the elements c? c in this case had to be a number in the, in the line, in the interval a, b, where I was taking the infimum. But now, in this other case, I'm taking the infimum, let's go back to the definition, over the covers of A. So whenever I move the infimum a bit towards the right, there will exist a cover such that this thing right here, the sum of rows of the cover, will be less than or equal to the infimum plus the little bit I, I was moving. So this is just the definition of the infimum. We're going to be using this definition and the analogous for the supremum a lot in this reproduction list. It's an essential tool in real analysis. So we have this, okay? We have that the sum of rows of the elements in the cover of A sub J is less than or equal to mu star of a sub j plus some weird number. But now the union over all the j's, sorry, j was starting from 1 to infinity, of a sub j's is a subset of the union of the union from i equals 1 to infinity of e sub i sub j because each of these was a subset of each of these for each j and so when we add now over all the j's what we get is that the sum from j equals 1 to infinity of the sum from i equals 1 to infinity of rho of e sub i sub j is smaller than or equal to the sum from j equals 1 to infinity of mu star of a sub j. I'm just adding over j on this equation plus delta because the sum of 2 to the minus j from j equals 1 to infinity is equal to 1. So that's the reason why we were adding this weird number in here, was just to make calculations look better and having a delta in the end. But joining these two things together, we get that mu star of a is smaller than or equal to the sum from j equals 1 to infinity of mu star of each a sub j plus delta. But now delta was arbitrary, so we can just let delta go to zero and we have finished proving part three. So this proves 
the countable sub additivity for mu star. Therefore, we have that mu star is an outer measure. And so we are able, given any set in part of x and the function rho that satisfies this, we are able to get an outer measure. So if you've been following the videos, you probably know where this is going. We are now, in a few videos, going to ask ourselves how can we define this function rho so that it actually makes sense with all the theory we've been working with. And once I have that function rho and I have the outer measure mu star defined this way, how can I find a measure? These are a few of the questions that we're gonna be asking and solving in this reproduction list.